Welcome once again to the Conversations That Matter podcast. I'm your host, John Harris, for a discussion today that I think you're going to find fascinating uh, with Lizzie Marbuck from Ohio. She's actually a Christian in Ohio. She runs the, or did, I, I should say, run the communications for the Ohio Right to Life. Before that, she was leading a faith coalition for the Ohio GOP. And she's been active in politics for a few years now, uh, since 2020, in an official capacity. And um, she was recently, some of you know this because I referenced it on the podcast, she was recently let go of her position as the communications uh, director for the Ohio Right to Life. And what I want to explore with her today, among other things, is why did that happen? Uh, Because it seemed to follow closely on the heels of a controversy with uh, a representative in in Ohio, Max uh, Weber, who was upset at something Lizzie posted that was pro-Christian. And uh, it, a lot of people assume there's a connection, but is there? So we're going to talk to Lizzie about it, see what's going on. Lizzie, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, John, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. My pleasure. Um, let me start here. Uh, the story has gained some traction, at least in Christian circles. I don't know if it's made waves outside of our circles, but... What kind of uh, support are you getting? Uh, I've I've really gotten support from a large audience, all the way from Ilhan Omar, <laughs> uh, where she tweeted out in support of my right to share the gospel on my personal Twitter account. Um, and yeah, I've had I've had many uh, different conservative groups reach out and say that they're you know 100 percent in support of of what I said and uh, that the congressman you know, definitely shouldn't have responded in that way. <laughs> so what actually happened? Uh, we, I saw the tweet. You put a tweet out there that was seemed like it was pretty vanilla. Like it was just Jesus is the only way. That's what Christians have always believed. And then that created a, a firestorm. Uh, I mean, I didn't, you weren't thinking that you were going to lose your position before that tweet, I assume. Uh, so there's, there is a little bit of, of background with that. Uh, so I started with Ohio Right to Life in March of 2022. And when I started with them, you know, I made it clear that I am definitely more of the uh, stream of the newer brand of conservatism that you actually talk about quite a bit on the show where there's, you know, this new brand of Christian and conservative where we're a little bit more brazen. We, we want to actually fight back. We want to actually, you know, be bold in our stances and not just embrace the old GOP way of, of being silent and never offending. And so I, I made that clear that that was definitely my more, uh, that that was the communication strategy that I wanted to, take on was a more masculine tone essentially in our uh comms and they said that that was fine and as i you know started to do that it definitely was it was apparent that it was not completely fine there there was a tension that that was there that was building between my comm strategy and what they were comfortable with uh and so there there was a build up really since the Dobbs decision all the way up until a couple weeks ago when they did let me go and so before the Max Miller tweet situation had happened uh my boss and I Peter Range actually did have a discussion where we discussed the possibility of us just parting ways of us just not being compatible in a, in a working sense uh, with our communication strategy. But no decision actually happened at that point. We left the conversation both saying that we would pray about it and and uh, maybe that we could explore the idea after I get back from maternity leave because I actually uh, am due September 24th. My husband and I are due with our first child. So Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, so that's that's where we left the conversation on Tuesday. And then Tuesday night was when Max Miller responded to my tweet, whose wife is actually on Ohio Right to Life's board. Um, and then two days later, my boss called me and said that the Miller situation has just become too much of a distraction for what we're up against in November and that my social media as a whole is too much and we have to part ways. So that's that's everything that that on my side, how I viewed the situation yeah. take place. And I think I made a mistake and I said, uh, Max, something else. I think remember, <laughs> it's Max Miller. OK, so Max Miller uh, is, is the uh, representative there that took issue. Now, um, 
so there, there's so many directions to go here, but one of the things that I saw immediately after this happened is there were Christians who jumped to the conclusion, okay, she's being uh, fired for her Christianity, which it sounds to me like in part you are, at least for being vocal about your Christianity. <laughs> um, but there was pushback. Uh, I, I don't remember who it was, but someone within the Ohio Right to Life, I guess, was trying to, was a source trying to say that it really had nothing to do with that. So, so you can confirm that that's not really accurate, that this did have something to do with it. Yes, it did have have something to do with it. Like I said, we did we had the discussion before the Miller situation even took place about us parting ways. Um, but as far as the time and the manner and the immediacy of it, um, it definitely played a role in that. And even uh, like I said, at the time of my firing in the conversation, which I have record of, um, the Miller situation is cited. It, it it's cited as a distraction, and then goes into my social media use as a whole. See, that's kind of crazy for me. I'm in New York right now as we're recording this. And Ohio to me is, even though it's a swing state, it's much more conservative. And <laughs> yes, I would think that that would be acceptable, that Ohio voters wouldn't be too offended by something like that. But uh, I, I don't know whether that's um, Max Miller being out of step or because he did, he did have to sort of apologize. It wasn't really an apology, but he did have to at least express regret that he had tweeted that at you. And uh, and, and uh, said, I think he said that your tweet was the most bigoted tweet or one of the most bigoted tweets he had ever seen. And he had to sort of retract that. But um, but at the same time, you did lose your job. So at least on an institutional level, there's I, I, what, what do you attribute that to? Is there is it weakness? Is there leftism kind of creeping into even pro-life organizations? Where is this coming from? Well, I, I think that you're correct when you say that Ohio is definitely more conservative, especially more than than New York. Uh, but even over the, the past few years, it's become a very red state on the grassroots level. And I know that as somebody who's worked in the grassroots uh, very closely, I I am very aware of what Ohio voters want and what they're asking for. However, um, the Ohio GOP apparatus is is not on that level. They are very much the quintessential rhino Republicans. I mean, before President Trump, our, our governor was was Kasich, right? Like he's right. he is who has built up our infrastructure in the Ohio GOP is, is a bunch of his people. And so that's how a lot of people think here in the state of Ohio that actually work in politics. And unfortunately, that's permeated even throughout Ohio Right to Life. Um, our president, Mike Anadakis, was notably close to Governor Kasich. He's the one uh, who actually lobbied Governor Kasich to veto the heartbeat bill twice in his capacity as president of Ohio Right to Life. And so our organization is very much affected by that. And so I don't think that it was leftism as much as it was uh, their fear of losing political influence and upsetting Congressman Max Miller and all of who he's connected with. Uh, his his wife, like I said, sits on our board and her father is a U.S. Senate candidate Bernie Marino. And both uh, Senate candidate Bernie Marino and Congressman Max Miller are very close to President Trump. Um, and so they they have a lot of influence in the state of Ohio when it comes to politics. And so I I don't want to make any assumptions of, uh, about, you know, what they were thinking, but I you you definitely have to call into question if if that had a hand in this. Is Max Miller is he Jewish? What's his religion? Uh yes, he is Jewish. He's Jewish. Okay. Um so so that's why he was offended by Jesus being the only way and and that uh this is something that I think I've talked about a number of times. I'm not the obviously only one to talk about this, but there is this managerial elitism that on the conservative side or the Republican side, we see this where they, yeah, they aren't like dyed in the wool leftists, but they won't really stop the leftists. They're not interested in that. They're interested in kind of maintaining a status quo, smooth sailing, uh, getting along. They don't want to be canceled by the left. They're afraid of that. So they respond to pressure from the left uh, in ways they won't respond to pressure from the right. And um, and I want to ask you about this because in my state where I am right now, and I, I, I realize there's some people who might be listening to this that are connected to this, but there is a local pro-life organization, the main one actually in my area. And um, my understanding is they uh, tell people, you know, you're, when you're doing 
counseling. You're not allowed to share the gospel. Uh, don't don't share about Jesus because, uh, and, and this is actually a Christian pro-life organization, but they're afraid that that's going to distract, again, what you said, that your social media activity was distracting, but that will distract from their mission to save babies, essentially. Um, wh what do you make of that? Is that a new talking point? Has that been around for a while? Why is it that even Christian pro-life orgs have trouble being Christian? Yeah, I, I think that it's definitely been around for a while. I, I think the point that we're at now is the strongest that it's been held just because as a whole, as a culture as a whole, we're in this post-Christian society. Um, but even from the very beginning, we saw the pro-life movement really try to tackle this merely from the stance of reason and science and never bringing up that foundational religious reason to be pro-life. And um, while you know, you and I can can agree that re uh, reason and science are great, amazing tools that God has gifted us with. Uh, our foundation should always be based on scripture and based on on truth, because that's where all truth stems from is from scripture. And so when you completely rip that foundation away and you're trying to, you know, uh, teach culture that killing babies is wrong, uh, merely on scientific grounds, you're going to come to a place where we recognize that it's a human life. We recognize that that abortion is murder, but we're not going to be morally uh, be believing that that's wrong because we'll have no problem saying, well, yes, it's murder, but it it doesn't matter because I'm my bodily autonomy matters more. And so we're, we're going to be faced with that moral question, but have no way to actually answer it because we've taken our foundation out from underneath us, which is the Bible. Um, and yes, yeah, so the, the pro-life movement definitely uh, has accepted that false doctrine that we're never supposed to bring up the gospel. We're never supposed to bring up God. Um, I, I remember there was a, a conversation in one of our board meetings uh, about our a mission statement where they wanted to add in some some people wanted to add in the phrase god given rights and all the politicos that are on our board were like well no we 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 can't mention god uh during this time because then it'll just you know give the left something to to talk about and, and claim that we're just you know religious uh, fascists that are trying to force our, our religion. And luckily, I, I will say uh, they lost on that vote. We did end up adding in God given to oh our mission goodness. statement. But just the, the the fact that that was even a concern to begin with is, is just insane. And, and like you said, it really just highlights uh, that they're so afraid of offending the left, but they have zero fears of offending our base or uh, really going against what what conservatives actually want. They they only fear the left, and that's who they want to impress through all of this. Well, that that sounds like that's who they worship then, because who you fear often is that that's who you um, venerate and aspire to, and want to please and sacrifice to. And um, it's so disturbing. I'm actually writing an article. Actually, I, I just finished it. I, I just finished an article that I'm hoping American Reformer runs. We'll see. Um, it's, it's kind of edgy and, you know, it's, but, but I, I actually use your example in it because, uh, it's all about the, uh, conservative response to Nazism and how in the 1950s you read conservatives and they're critiquing its ideological components. They're saying that, um, it's totalitarian. It's, it's basically, they're the same critiques just about the use of the Soviets, the use of the Nazis. They didn't say things like, well, if you love your people too much, that makes you a Nazi. Right. And, and the left was doing that, though. The left, you know, 1952, Harry Truman is doing this, uh, accusing Dwight Eisenhower of being pro-Nazi, uh, even though he defeated the Nazis. And, you know, fast forward to today, the Republicans today sound exactly like the Democrats did in the 50s, like all their villains are somehow tied into fascism or Nazism somehow, whether that's people who are uh, venerate their Confederate heritage or, or at least want to honor that, or it's people who um, are just like moms for liberty, who just don't want their kids groomed or MAGA Republicans. Or, I mean, there's so many groups now that are now con suspected of being fascist that never were before. And, and, and it's gotten down. I, this is the example that I use of you. It's gotten down to the point where it's like, if you're just a Christian, if you just literally <laughs> say Jesus is the only way, there's like a, an assumption that, you know, that's kind of fascist. That's kind of like Nazi-esque or something like that. And it's this big boogeyman. 
how do you um, move on from that now? Now that you've been given the the red letter, I, I mean, do you work for another pro life organization? Do you like? Are you blacklisted now from GOP circles? How, how, what's the future for you? You know, that's a good question. I'm not too sure if I'm blacklisted here in the state of Ohio. I'm sure. To be frank, I'm sure that I am. I'm sure that. You know, the the Ohio Republican Party, any of the uh, state legislators or other, you know, organizations in Ohio would be uh, slow to really give me an opportunity. I'm not sure. I, I haven't sought that out yet, um, but I, I'm, I'm sure that I definitely um, am blacklisted in some circles, especially uh, among the pro-life uh, circles. I've I've tried to reach out to a few people um, that are just in other organizations, and and it's very clear that there there's a distance that's that's happening. Um, and so it's it's sad, but like you said, yeah, uh, yeah. If you if you're just a Christian who actually has conviction, who actually believes what you claim, and you're not just a nominal Christian, you are viewed as extreme. You're viewed as as some radical who's crazy. And uh, has to be tamed, and so it's just it's really sad. Even amongst pro life circles, which the the pro life political world is oftentimes viewed as a more virtuous version of the political world, that they're that that's where the real Christians go to work in politics. Um, and right. that's what that's, I thought. Yeah, and that's that's definitely. Uh, not the case at the top. There's plenty of really good Christians that are getting involved at the grassroots or even at the lower levels in these organizations. Uh, but the people that are running the organizations that are making the decisions, a lot of them are very embarrassed of the Christian faith and really have no interest in it. Hey, everyone. I just want to take a moment to share with you about a new sponsor for the podcast, tinybibles.com. That's tinybibles.com. Here's uh, one of mine. I have a copy. This is the Tiny Bible, and it is uh, the world's smallest Bible. You can see it there, and the print, the typeset, is just incredible. Look at my fingers compared to how small the printing is. Um, I can barely read it. I have pretty good vision, but they do give you a magnifying glass in the case with it, so you can actually read it for yourself. Now, why would you want one of these? Well, there's a few reasons. Uh, number one, this is a collector's Bible because in 1896, David Bryce of Glasgow was the one who produced originally Bibles of this size. And he did so so that soldiers across the British Empire had something that they could carry no matter where they went. It's very versatile, doesn't take up any room, and you can bring it with you wherever you go. In fact, uh, for times of persecution, this can also be handy just because uh, hard drives can be erased, phones can be confiscated, uh, but something this small is very easy to conceal. And, uh, and so uh, it, it's, it's a fascinating uh, Bible. I know many of us in the Christian world have multiple Bibles, so this is a fascinating one to add to your collection. You can get one at tinybibles.com. That's tinybibles.com. Learn about the story of uh, how this uh, gentleman, uh, Martin Chamberlain, decided to recreate, uh, reprint these Bibles. Um, I, I, I found out also that they actually had a, uh, they, they were even banned uh, from one website because of their doctrinal stance, that they believe the Bible taught things the Bible actually teaches. Uh, go figure that one out. Um, but they've, uh, through, through a long process and a, and a road uh, that they've taken, they have, come to the, they, they have come to the end point, and they have these available. So go check it out today, tinybibles.com, tinybibles.com, and make sure to let them know that you heard about it on the Conversations That Matter podcast. God bless. Why are they there then? That's my question. I mean, they just have a moral, I guess, conviction, but it does it's not rooted in anything really. Yeah, I I mean, I can't I can't speak to everyone's heart. I know that Ohio Right to Life CEO Peter Range, he genuinely cares. I've had many in-depth conversations with him and he he genuinely cares about the issue. Uh he is Catholic, but he he is rooted in his faith why he is against it and he has no qualms with bringing up scripture. Um but unfortunately, he doesn't he's not the one who makes any kind of legislative decisions. He's not the one who's making uh major decisions for the organization. It's pres it's our president or 
not mine anymore, but Ohio Right to Life's president, uh, Mike Anadakis, who's really doing that. And Mike Anadakis definitely is not rooted in his faith, at least from what I can tell from the outside. I pray for you know his, his heart that that would change and maybe it just hasn't actually shown on the outside yet. Uh, but yeah, he, it, it seems from the outside looking in that he is really just interested in his own political gain, his own political interest, and he is willing to really um, sell out the mission if it means that he can get in closer with a politician. I, I uh, remember there was a, a couple months back when one of our politicians was trying to uh, bring forth the death penalty. And our governor, Mike DeWine, he's very much against the death penalty, but in Ohio it's legal. So he's just essentially paused all um, all executions since he, he took over as governor. And so there was a bill that they wanted to bring forth to end the death penalty. And Mike was, was essentially trying to lobby our, our board to get us to come out against the death penalty so that the legislators would be more inclined to vote for that bill. And uh, yeah, yeah, so he's he's just done more lobbying work for the actual politicians rather than lobbying to the politicians with the grassroots want, if that makes sense. It does make sense. So there's a disconnect, a, a big disconnect there. Uh, that's interesting because in evangelicalism, we've seen over the last I would say 10 to 15 years, especially. Um, obviously, it started before that, but you have people like Karen Swallow Pryor, and um, now I'm blanking, <laughs> but uh, Ron Sider was kind of the first guy, I guess, to do this. But e even people like um, David Platt uh, and, and others trying to take the pro life movement and say there should be about you know 10 or 15 pro life issues. Uh, murdering children is just one of those things, but so is the death penalty. Uh, Ron Sider saw, thought smoking was part of it, a nuclear proliferation. And so they cram all these um, mostly leftist issues into the pro-life movement. So, so you're seeing that actually happen, though, in, in pro-life organizations. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and it's so frustrating because immediately after Dobbs, our conversation wasn't, OK, let's let's get a bill passed to end all abortion. Our conversation was, OK, let's get bills passed that show that we support women. That was the focus that a lot of our board members were taking. Playing defense when you when you've yes. won when you've won a battle. That's not. Yes. You, don't, you you should be able to capitalize on that and make greater gains. That's that's crazy to me. Um, strategically speaking, at least, um, is the pro life industry an industry? Is it is it? I mean, is there a money making component to this? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, there's a. There are a lot of good faith people that are in the pro-life movement, and so I don't want to say that everyone is seeing it that way, but it absolutely has become an industry, especially at the lobbying level. So your organizations that are going to be mainly focused on getting legislation passed has become an industry and not so much a money-making industry you know, in terms of selling things, but a, an access gaining industry where someone can gain political access and political influence to further their own career. And I, I hate to continue to bring him up, but he's just such such the, the perfect example of what I'm talking about with our, our president. You know, it's come out that our president is not only a lobbyist for pro-life work, but he's also a lobbyist for medical marijuana and for pet land. And so, I, I mean, he's very clearly using a lot of this influence to get him other clients and to so, get him even more political power. Now, maybe I'm the last one to know about this. You said pet land? Yes. So I, I don't know all of the details of it, um, but I mean, I, I I feel like that's kind of uh conflicting to lobby for puppy mills and also oh, for life see. work yeah. i see wow okay um yeah that is interesting uh that it seemed yeah it's disturbing too i suppose what organizations i know you mentioned one to me uh end abortion ohio.com was, was the that organization but what organizations can you point christians to because i think there are people even in this audience who well-meaning and they give to pro-life organizations. They go to the banquets that pro-life organizations um, and raffles that they they hold, and they they hear good things when they attend those those uh, the, those particular events. And 
you know, and, and I know how it works in politics. Like all the people who don't even agree with you, they know how to make a stump speech. They know how to make you open your checkbook and write a check to them. You're on the inside though. You've seen how the sausage is made. What organizations should Christians be supporting? Well, like you said, End Abortion Ohio is probably the best right now. They're the ones who are actually lobbying to bring forth a bill of equal protection in the state of Ohio. Another organization that is solid is, I would say, Ohio Christian Alliance. Uh, Chris Long is the one who runs the organization, and he sincerely is dedicated to getting Christians Christians and churches involved. Um, and he's spoken up a lot in, in these backroom meetings where we're talking about strategy. And he's made it clear that, you know, if we're not doing this right, I'm not going to be a part of it. And so I, I really admire that he's willing to take a stand as well. Um, it's, it's kind of funny because him and I would always joke about our, our meetings that we would go to him, me, and, um, another gentleman would always be the ones who would speak up and kind of push back on what's going on. And ironically enough, we were also the only Protestants in the room. So, <laughs> um, wow. yeah, we, we saw some of, some of that dynamic, but yeah, I would say end abortion, Ohio and Ohio Christian Alliance are definitely the, the best. If you're somebody younger and you just want to get involved in, um, pro-life work, really in the grassroots level, um, created equal is, is good. They're the ones who actually show the pictures who will go out and, um, do sidewalk counseling and will go out to the street and just show the pictures of abortion. Um, there has been some question about if they're for or against equal protection bills. So I'm not sure about that, but I, I do know that the people in their organization are, are genuine in wanting to bring forth the truth there as, as well. Wow. I went to a, a an event, I suppose you could say, for for Love Life. Have you heard of them? I have not. No. Okay, maybe they're not in Ohio. Um, I know they're in Tennessee. They're in New York, but uh, I was impressed at least. It, they're Christian and they do some of the sidewalk counseling and they get churches involved in a way that's not too rah rah political, but is is more um, uh, focused on prayer and and so forth. But anyway, uh, that that's an organization that I. I I would feel comfortable, I think, sending people to as well. Um, so uh, the timing of this for you, I guess, I don't know if it, it, it seems like it maybe it was providential because you are going to you're going to be taking care of a, a baby here soon. So <laughs> you you don't need to um, have the hassle of dealing with these controversies and, and being involved in the political world. I'm assuming, though, at some point you're going to want to get back involved. You think you'll be involved in a pro-life setting or a political setting uh, of a different kind? I definitely don't think that I'll get back involved in the pro-life movement uh, per se. I, I am somebody who loves working in politics and loves to just really uh, call people to action. And so I'd imagine that I would stay involved in the political world in some capacity, but I'm not completely sure how that would look. Uh, the The reason why I don't think that I would get involved in the pro life movement as a whole is is just because I I'm having a hard time seeing that there could be any kind of redemption in these pro life organizations that are actually lobbying for legislation. And I don't mean to come off harsh with that, but you know I just. Every, every pro-life organization that I thought might be on board with, you know, a bill of equal protection or speaking truthfully, um, they have, have proven that they're more interested in political strategy and political expediency. And so I just hesitate with that. I feel like we, we really have to tackle this issue from the bottom up, from churches up. I think that if we can figure out a way to really get pastors to take the leadership on this, um, that's how, how we're going to be able to really win and, and make a difference. Yeah. It's interesting that there is this, uh, battle kind of between the pro-life movement and abortion abolitionists that I guess for lack of a better term, I've, <laughs> I've been on the fence or the sidelines of, uh, however you see it, I guess. And it's the difficulty that I've had with some of the more aggressive abolitionist voices, I suppose, is that 
there, there, there does seem to be some gains that are made through incrementalism. And in fact, I think it was Doug Wilson had written an article years ago called Smash Mouth in, uh, Incrementalism or something like that, mm-hmm. which was kind of a just like you, you throw everything at abortion to end it. And and, and I, I guess I agreed with that. I haven't maybe thought about it as deeply as I could. But um, I'm wondering now if part of the division between these groups is there's a jadedness. Like there's people like yourself who have been in these pro-life groups thinking that they're doing something good. And then they just don't, um, they, they see some good, but they don't see the, the people that run these organizations actually sharing the end goal that you, you would think that a pro-life organization would have, which is to completely end abortion. And so, um, so they end up, I mean, I, I've heard people say more on the abolitionist side that, you know, the whole industry is corrupt and that kind of thing, which, you know, I don't know if that's true, but, but, but that it makes sense to me. I mean, do you see that, that there's, um, that people who actually want to see abortion ended, they get discouraged and, and then they funnel into other groups that are committed to that or, or they just, I guess, fall off the map. They're not going to be involved. Yeah, I think there's there's definitely a, a sense of discouragement and just feeling like there's there's no hope within these these organizations. And I think that there's a, a, a sense of truth to that because a lot of the people that are on the bottom or not even on the bottom, they're you know at a pretty high level where they have direct access to. Uh, the the decision making people they'll try to even just open up these conversations about uh, the abolitionist side of things and they don't want any kind of part of it and now that we're in a post row society um, really it has been exposed that most of these organizations don't actually share in the same end goal as most grassroots pro-lifers want. Uh, most of these organizations, um, I, I mean, there was the, the infamous letter that went out last year um, in reaction to what took place in Louisiana where they were going to pass yes. a bill of equal protection and 76 uh, pro-life organizations signed, signed a letter saying that we do not support this because it would punish the woman. And uh, they are completely against equal protection because it would potentially criminalize women that are getting abortion. Um, and so because of that, we actually don't share the, the same end goal because as, as Christians, I mean, we, we obviously aren't going to be for any kind of bill of, of partiality or any kind of end goal that gives immunity to somebody that is taking place in a murder. Um, and, yeah. and so even, even for the, the pro-lifer that, is comfortable with incremental goals, but does firmly want that end goal of abolishing all abortion. Um, the pro-life organizations don't share that. Mm. And and when I say pro-life organizations, again, I mean the lobbying organizations. Right. Um, they right. they don't share that that same end goal. They they are comfortable with simply just closing abortion clinics, but not doing anything about women who are actually uh, getting abortions on their own. And with the pill now, over 50% of abortions take place through the pill. And with uh, websites like Aid Access or Plan C, you can order the pill as a woman completely legally in a state where abortion is banned. So in a state like Texas or or Oklahoma, uh, no. I, I you, you can go online, order the pill, take it, kill your baby, and that's completely legal. There's no uh, legal recourse for that. And but it, the the pro life politicians in those states are are claiming that they've ended all abortion when it, they very clearly have not, uh, and they have no interest in actually tackling that issue. I even brought that up to Mike Gonadakis. Um, I I laid it out saying, you know, if we don't tackle this, then abortion will never actually end in the state of Ohio. And he just shrugged his shoulders and walked away. Oh my goodness, yeah, that's that's horrific. Um... One of the things that I, I've wondered, I would love to get your take on this, is pro-life organizations have had this strategy for years of, um, you know, trying, and I think it's it's valid to try to show that this fetus is actually a baby, right? Scientifically, it's a baby. And so once you come to that conclusion, then, of course, you'll be against abortion. Um, in Canada right now, and I know we're not Canada, but we are following on the tails of Canada uh, I have heard that euthanasia ha- has just skyrocketed and assisted suicide and um, that uh, it's protected by law. 
and maybe someone who's Canadian listening can verify that for me. If that's true, though, and I know it's true in in uh, two states in our country as well, I believe um, that that shows me something because there's no question about whether a grown person is a person, right? There, if you're uh, pursuing doctor assisted suicide, euthanasia, then that's a person. Um, the, and, and there's no, like, it's really just an evil heart at that point. It's just, you, you want to murder. And I, I wondered whether or not that's a pro-life organizations and, and the whole strategy needs to be rethought a little bit. And, and Christianity would help this to, to introduce the idea that actually maybe a lot of these people know what they're doing. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they, they're not, it, it's not a, an ignorance that they're just being suckered into, killing their children and, 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 you know, doctors even that are participating just don't know it's a baby. Like, I, I kind of think they do. I mean, is that your sense too? What do you, what do you think of that? Like, should we change our strategy to be more aggressive and to just to point fingers more and to say, no, you're, you're being evil. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's really where, um, the difference in, in communication strategy came into play between me and Ohio right to life is because I, I, agree with you that no, we need to change our, our strategy because it's not working. And what we've done for the past 50 years, uh, I feel like we have had a hand to play in teaching culture that this isn't an actual life or that if it is a, a life, it's okay to take it. You know, when it, one of one of the critiques that abolitionists often make that does make a lot of sense when you actually think about it is these the, the law definitely is a tutor. And so when you're when you're passing these laws, you're you're saying abortion isn't health care. Abortion is killing. But then you're passing laws that are regulating abortion as health care. They're calling it health care. And they're saying you can kill the, the baby uh, before it has a heartbeat or you can kill the, the baby before it feels pain or before it's viable or any any other kind of arbitrary marker. We're, we're passing these laws that are teaching even pro-life supporters that that's when life begins. Um, or even if we're, we're teaching that life begins at conception, we're still teaching that it's okay to kill up until that point, even if it is a life. And so I think that we've we've had a hand to play at that. And it just kind of goes back to what I was saying in the beginning, where we've ripped away our foundation by taking the Bible out of it. Um, be, because, of, of course, if we live in a world that's secular, that's humanist, um, where we believe that our ancestors are you know, our fish and apes, then uh, of course we're, we're going to find a way to justify killing a life that's inconvenient to us, whether they're too old or whether they're too, too young. We're, we're going to find a way to justify that because our, our hearts are deceitfully wicked and, and we are evil uh, without, you know, Christ living within us. And so I, I think that we absolutely, especially now in the world that we live in today in our country, uh, we have to just speak truth boldly and we have to say it in a clear manner. Like you said, like, no, that's just evil. That is wrong. That's murder. Um, and we can't dance around that because we've allowed feminism to completely hijack the movement now where we're, we're so afraid of offending any kind of woman that even if she's as heartless as could be, um, like, like we saw a few weeks ago where some teenager um, said that she aborted her, her baby at like 30 something weeks because she wanted to fit into her jeans again. Like we, it, the abort, the pro-life movement still wants to call that kind of woman a victim mm -hmm. because they're so bought into the feminist idea. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I think that the only way out of this is through uh, conviction and clarity. And we, we have to, to speak that otherwise we're never going to win on the issue. And, and the thing, the response that you get when you say that, cause I've said that is, uh, that if you don't view them as victims, if you want to criminalize or punish mothers, right, who want to kill their children, then we're going to lose. We'll lose bad. It'll be horrible for us. The only winning strategy is to agree with the left that the mothers are, are victims no matter what. And uh, even if they want to kill their children and that, um, yeah, and, and that and I guess that it's we shouldn't imply any evil motives to anyone who's involved in that process. 
Yeah, it, and that just really makes no sense when you when you think about it. First of all, it's been tried and true for the past 50 years, and we're in a worse place now than we were 50 years ago. <laughs> so, I I mean, just it, it, the, the, you know, evidence doesn't bear that out. It's, it's shown the opposite. But also just, I mean, logically, when you think about that, if so you're saying that if you beat her on the bush, if you don't speak clearly, then people will come to our side more that that doesn't make any sense it's the people who have conviction who have the willpower to actually push forth their agenda and push forth what they're actually wanting to get accomplished that end up winning we see that with the left uh as crazy as they are i'll i'll give them this they have conviction <laughs> and yeah. they're they're not afraid to say unpopular truths and and then make them popular they that's what they've done with every single issue uh i don't know if you're familiar with um with the the book after the ball but um vody bakum talks talks about it uh, can, and it concerns the you know lgbt agenda and it was a book written no, in, I haven't in, seen it. It, yeah so i i would definitely look it up um vody bakum has has a, a great sermon where he breaks it down but it's a book that was written in 1989 and when you read it, it reads like a history book, but it was a book written by three gay activists that laid out their entire plan on how they're going to take over culture to accept the homosexual agenda. What's it called? Uh, After the Ball. After the there's, Ball. It, there's an article that they wrote a year before that uh, that's a shorter version that kind of outlines it. I forget the name. I'll have to send it to you. Okay. Um, yeah, but yeah. Do. and 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 they they lay it out they say in order to tackle this we have to get uh quote respectable gay people out in in front of culture we have to uh condemn the the church as as bigots and and hateful and homophobes we have to do do this and this and this and they lay out their plan to aggressively take over culture and it worked and uh and it, it, christians in response to that and conservatives in response to that have just laid over and they, and we're doing the same thing on the issue of life as well. Um, and so I think that the only way out of this is through conviction and through strength and through masculinity. Really, we have to set aside these, these soft tones. We have to set aside idolizing feminism, whether it's in a Christian manner or a worldly manner, we, we have to set it aside and we have to allow men to lead. The, the fact that the pro-life movement even bought into uh, the, the left's talking points that like, oh, you can't say that because you're a man. Uh, there were so many interviews that I did purely just because they said, well, you're you're a woman, you should be uh, doing the interview. Interesting. And that's, that, that's so weak. If we, if we had more men actually standing yeah. up, leading the fight, I, I I feel like that would actually have a greater impact than having, you know, all of the the women leading from the front. Yeah, where where are the men? That's the big question. Uh, you know, what, yeah. where, <laughs> what, why? So it's interesting because that's the same thing I saw with CRT. Evangelical organizations, conservative organizations, uh, they had to find, and, and there are some very talented and well spoken people who are minorities who can speak on the issue of BLM and CRT, but there there were obvious instances of them you know, needing a minority to say those things, uh, to <laughs> avoid the charge of racism. And it sounds like the same things at work here. We need a woman to say these things or we'll get the charge of misogyny. And, and that's, once you do that, it just seems to me, you give up truth. You give up that. Um, I mean, I, I guess there, maybe there's strategy to some of this, but like, you know, really like it, it, it's either true or it's not. And we want someone who can articulate it. That's, that should be the main requirement. Uh, and of course, as I think, as you say, men should be on the forefront of these things because this is war in a sense. Um, this, I mean, you, you're, you, you are a casualty of a political war, even though I know it's politics, but it's, it's getting aggressive out there and, uh, and, and, and they're aggressive towards us. Right. <laughs> so yeah. it doesn't make sense for us to be, um, uh, not aggressive back and, 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 and we have a, 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 the truth from the word of God. We have something solid to stand on. We have the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the gospel. We, we don't, we're not um, uh, guilt ridden because of our sin. We have the truth. We can offer that. I mean, there's so many things that should make us bold. Uh, any final thoughts from you? Anything you want to share or, or place you want to send anyone? Uh, well, just a, a final thought in response to, to what you said is, I mean, you, you pretty much laid it out perfectly that we're fighting this war on the enemy's premises. We're, we're adopting the left's 
premises and their starting point and allowing that to define and frame the entire uh, fight and, and frame the entire argument. And that's that's going to lose every single time. That's not strategy. That's just cowardice. And so we we can't allow that. We have to get more comfortable with rejecting the left's ideas, beginning with you know, the, the popular notions that we've accepted as a society. And I think that's, that's with politics as a whole, with culture as a whole, not just on the pro-life issue, but on every issue. Um, we, we have to not be afraid to reject these common notions that everyone has just kind of accepted and never thought twice about. We, we, we have to fight back on those and bring those into question, even at the risk of us sounding, um, you know, like crazy people that are anti, uh, that are you know pushing against culture. We have to be able to risk that. Um, but with it, with that said, uh, as far as you know, sending sending people places, like I said, definitely go check out uh, endabortionohio.com. They're a great organization, and Ohio Christian Alliance. Um, they're they're doing great work as well, and can really use our support uh, to to help get churches and pastors engaged. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for that. And uh, thank you for taking the courageous stand that you've taken, Lizzie. I appreciate it. Of course. Well, thank you. And and your uh, podcast and what you do definitely has helped guide me through that and, and uh, give me the, the courage that I need. So keep oh, doing what you're kind. doing as well. <laughs> okay. God bless.